Um, this session here is the simplest session of the day. Our magic, what we're going to tell you, is just plain common sense. There's no extra magic and gimmicks. Just like some best practices on, on how to do things. At the same time, while being the easiest to understand, it might be the, the hardest session to implement. But we'll try to tell you why to do that, to, to, why to do these things, and, and what kind of tools we can use for implementing these things. Um, before we get started, we'd like to know a bit about who we are here. Um, so, how many of you are some sort of developers? How many of you are some sort of system sys admins or, or do that sort of things? You can raise your hands multiple times. Multiple descriptions with you. How many of you are somehow managers of, of teams or managers of companies? Or Wow, we seem to have a really nicely fitted audience for the, for the session. Um, We'll tell shortly who we are. Okay, uh, my name is Ilari Makela, and uh, I work, work as a service manager in Wunderkraft Finland, and my responsibilities are uh, uh, managing and, and leading the continuous development and hosting team. And my background, uh, for with Drupal I have worked around three years, four years, but before that I worked with WordPress, uh, I chose WordPress because when I first tried Drupal, WordPress was much simpler and better at that time. Yes. And I still work a bit with WordPress during my work at, uh, as an as entrepreneur with my own company. Alright. <coughs> I'm Jonas Kiminki, the same guy who was the substitute for the keynote. Uh, I'm the managing director of Wunderkraft Finland. There are about 35 people uh, in Finland. Um, we have two offices in, in Helsinki and in Turku, but as a Wunderkrat Wunder as a whole, we have, depending on how you calculate, between 120 and 150 people, so we took 130 there to be somewhat precise. Uh, we're the largest Drupal consultancy in Europe. This is why you like it. Um, the largest Drupal consultancy in Europe operating in Finland, Latvia, UK, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, doing a lot of business in um, Switzerland from the, the um, German team, also uh, Sweden and Norway. Um, that might be around maybe And uh, if you try to compare us, for example, to Aquil. Uh, we do everything in Drupal from A to Z. So we do the uh, initial business analysis and, and, and the development of the new sites, and then we also take care of the hosting. So we are from the A to Z Drupal company. Yeah, we have a lot of Drupal developers, whereas Aqua has a lot of sales people. There are two very different companies. All right. Um, the topic that we chose for this session was made deliberately to sound a bit evil to get customers in a vendor lock-in. Of course, when, when doing Drupal and other proprietary system, vendor lock-in lock means, means something different. The traditional vendor lock-in means that you have your software, you get clients, and then the clients are married to you whether they like it or not. Because it's your software. Nobody else can um, develop it or, or build on it. The open source vendor lock-in is basically just being so good or or so well, so good in your business that the customers can risk changing to another vendor because they're just way better than the, the comparison. Um, the way that we approach the vendor lock in, in this session 
is that projects have a start, projects have a finish. But from the user point of view, when the project is finished and the, and the service is launched, the, the service is, or the website is actually zero days old. So that's, that's when the um, thing begins, that's when your return on investment starts to grow the, the positive side. Um, the customer velocity, sorry, the customer satisfaction is made not in the implementation project, but in the years to follow. So that's where you do create the, the, the kind of vendor logic. Um, a simple example of this would be that if you have a very high performance team that implements a very good service for you, the, the customer might be happy at that point. But if you fail to be good at continuous development, customer client or client relationship management and, and support, the satisfaction will go down. Whereas if you have an average team doing an average project, but your maintenance is really kick ass, then the Things can be fixed afterwards, or things can be improved uh, in the maintenance phase. So, if you take a project and look at it, look at it uh, on, a, for example, two-year time frame, it's kind of clear that the things that you did after the three-month implementation project is way more important to the customer uh, satisfaction than the three months you did in the beginning. Um, for those of you who are not Drupal shop owners or managers or, or team managers, it's okay that everybody doesn't want to do this. We have a lot of people in, at our company that say that I just want to build stuff, I want to do projects, I don't want to do anything else. That's fine. But from the company point of view, doing high class maintenance is really good for the company. Because it creates a steady cash flow, so you get a smaller amount of money than you get in the project, but you get it for multiple years. And of course, if you're doing a really good job at it, when they need to do the next project, it will of course first turn to you. Um, and as I said, it is how you create the customer satisfaction. So in the business of Drupal, in the business of open source software, when you're selling stuff to your client, one of the most important things is that you get a very good reference. The references are the most important things, uh, thing that you have when doing sales for new clients. So of course, they want to call up the old clients or they want to see the websites and they want to see the good brands that you uh, achieved uh, in, in the previous project. So, um, satisfaction is, is crucial. And a high performance maintenance team can even do you so much more than just have a look very good from, from the outside. They can really help you on the inside of the company as well. Um, of course, as far as Best practices go, there's no point in trying to invent the wheel yourself every time. So, Zappos is a company that's probably the best known in the world uh, for their customer service. They don't operate in Finland or they probably don't operate in Europe at all. They're an American company. They sell shoes. They are not known for selling shoes, they are known for their superb. Uh, customer service. So they've, they've said that we're not in the business of selling shoes, we're in the business of customer service. And I copy pasted a quote from their about.zappos.com site. And they said, we've been asked by a lot of people how we've grown so quickly, and the answer is actually really simple. We've aligned the entire organization around one mission to provide the best customer service possible. 
internally we call this our wow philosophy. We kind of try to uh, adapt the same thinking into, into our business and the continuous development and maintenance in specific. All right, that's the motivational part. That's why you should be interested in these things. Let's next move on to how we do it for what we do. Uh, okay, so as Jonas said in the beginning, uh, this is very simple session, but actually executing the things that we are saying here is the hard part. And that's the part where we are all also constantly learning new things, we are failing, and that's, that's the thing, that the execution is the hardest part. Uh, internally we have uh, this uh, HUMU team, as we call uh, I don't know it in, in, in Estonia, but in Latvian it's SMITES, so it means SMILE. So we have a team named SMILE, and that the basis of this team is that uh, around uh, one and a half a year ago, I was the only one of us doing uh, every day the, the maintenance and, and hosting and, and upsells for the new, new uh, uh, for the old customers. But at that point, we noticed that one man is not enough. And at that point also, we decided that we need, we, we are doing good, but we can do even better. So uh, we decided that one man is not enough, we need another person for that. And also when we started thinking about the, the basis of the, our, our team and I started thinking what, how, how, what's, what's the main, main thing that we are going to excel. So that's where the, the SMILE team, HUNU team name came up. So our purpose is to simply just make customers smile after every act we do, after every communication Whatever we do, customer needs to smile. That's that's how we measure uh, if customer is satisfied. Uh, after that, we have now grown as a five-man engineering team because, of course, we are getting more and more clients, and the old clients are not going away. So the, the amount of work is ha for happily for us is already like getting too big and we are already maybe getting one or two persons more to our team at the moment. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the thing that we actually try to achieve is to get customers smile. And at the same point, the customers, they feel safe, they feel confident, uh, they trust us more. So we get the, the more fluent our, our, our communications with the client, uh, the client doesn't have to always like they they can say that okay we want this and then we propose something and they don't we don't need to do some kind of negotiations complete negotiations uh, arguments all the time because we have already built the confidence with the client just by achieving that they smile after every act we do uh, also uh, as i said uh, the thing that we try to do is to make customers smile. Even though we do technical things, our main thing is communication. If you do a great technical job, it might be great for you can say internally with your team like woohoo and your developers will be happy and maybe pop up uh, some champagne or something. But if you don't communicate it to the client, it may be invisible to the client because not all the things that you do are visible. If you do some technical achievements that, that you make the page faster, but the client doesn't see anything new. The client might have, to, well, where did my money go? You spent just 5,000 euros and I see nothing. But if you communicate it clearly and say what you did and communicate it in a positive way and not in a technical way, you get the customer smile again. Can I let me say one thing, uh, one example from this week? Um, as I said here, the most, most important superpower is great communications and not great technical skills. And of course you need the technical skills, when, but when you reach the kind of sufficient level for technical skills, the, the rest becomes more important. And, and as I said, we're constantly improving, which means that we're not perfect. Uh, I think it was the day before yesterday, or even yesterday, one of the team members sent uh, via our extranet, uh, kind of the ticketing system that we have, um, a message to, to one of our bigger clients that have 
uh, that has had some, some performance issue on their, issues on their really, really large site. And he's wrote in the, in the ticket that he's implemented some ESA stuff, ESI stuff and um, done something with like additional layers of caching and that kind of thing. So it took an hour or two before the uh, customer replied that, is this ESI stuff a good or a bad thing? Because of course, if you're a technical developer and you don't know that if you do varnish and ESI, it means that you can page cache more pages or whatever, but those means don't mean anything to non technical people. So that's one example of not being perfect at that, but learning. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, as we are very important to our, our company as an external resource, we are also very important. Uh, we have a very important role internally also. You might say that uh, our developers that are in our human team know what the other developers did last summer. Because we, we see all the code, we see all the bugs every time the, the project gets released. We see all the things that they have done. And it's really, really in, in, uh, important for the quality assurance that we pass the information back to that stuff. Because if we don't do it, first of all, uh, we, again, we have to fix all the same bugs again if we don't communicate what they did wrong. And second of all, uh, we get better products, better profits for the company. Simply why I said that we are, that's, that's very also very important internal role. And also uh, our team, I'm very sorry to say, we use the word proactive. Sorry about that. <laughs> but we, we are very uh, proactive on, on the handovers because as we discussed before with Jonas when making this session, if we wouldn't be like saying like two weeks, three weeks, or even in the beginning of the project and asking, hey, how do you want the, the production servers handled, the staging servers handled? It would be like two days before launch, the guys would call, for example, to Jonas and ask, hey, hey, what about, what about our production servers? What are we going to do? And it would be a total mess. So it's also internally the communication that's really, really, really uh, important thing. Okay. All right. Then to my favorite example of, of this thing. And this is actually the stuff that was said today or, or in the meeting where we formed this team a bit over a year ago. I, I took an example. You have two identical sites. They both crash for whatever reason. And they both take 30 minutes to fix and to get up. And in, in the other uh, service, the customer is sad because they, their site had 30 minutes of downtime and they feel kind of a lack of confidence. And the other example, the customer is happier, more satisfied, more confident with what we do than before the crash. And the examples go like this. Example A, site crashes, uh, the engineers get a whatever SMS message saying that customer X site down. They go to the site, log into the server, do whatever, reboot a service or something. And, and get it up and running. 15 minutes into the crash, the customer notices as well, calls somebody in panic saying that, hey, our site is down. The, the engineer replies that, yeah, we know. And then they fix it and done. And the customer notices like half an hour after the, the crash, all right, now it's working again. In the second example, the site crashes, it's done. We notice, all right. There's Nginx saying blah, 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 or nothing working. We call the client, or we SMS the client, that there's a problem with the ser service, we're fixing it. They didn't even notice that it's down, but they know that they know, or we notice, and, and some, somebody's fixing it. We do the same fix as before. Um, then we communicate back to the client, saying that, hey, there was a problem in the Nginx configuration, we started the, the service back up and we fixed a pin there and that same problem won't happen again. After the second example, the customer is by all likelihood more happy with 
what our maintenance does than before the crash. Of course, when things work, maintenance teams are invisible. Nobody knows whether you're doing nothing or not. It's just not there. Um, but we, with these examples, us being very good on communications, very uh, efficient in what we do, and still doing the same technical things, results to way better customer satisfaction. Yes, sir. So basically, if we think about the lessons for this, is that the number one, communicate clearly, and the number two, which might come as a surprise for someone, but every crash, every bug, every problem is actually a chance to make your customer happier than the customer was before. Because Especially when you're producing a service which is an ongoing thing, and the only thing that the customer sees is when things change or break. Okay, so uh, this is very simple rule. This is actually written uh, to our, or was written in our old office and will be written in our new office. And we just yeah, yeah, which is moved in the, in the wall. It actually has four points there, but here we have made it simpler with three points. So basically what you need to do every time, because Developers, they are really, really good. They get the alert, and they are really, really oh, I get my hands on the on the code now. I get to tinker the server and so on. So they, most of the times, they may forget to communicate with the client first. Hey, your service is down. We are fixing it. It takes 15 seconds, but they forget it. So we have made this very, very simple rules: communicate, act, and communicate again. And that is victory. You might want to write this up. Yeah. Communicate, uh, <laughs> communicate. And of course, if it's a complicated problem, you can repeat, you re repeat steps two and three over and over again until you, it's fixed. And, and if it was a kind of a bad thing, you can do a retrospective later telling that uh, these and these things were not perfect and now we've improved on them and not to worry, this won't happen. Have you written it down? Can I change the slide? We will upload them. Don't worry. Uh, okay, then as, as we have all, we're also talked, uh, already talked about that the communication is very vital in every point, but it's uh, also very vital how to do the communication. So, very simple question, why, is very, very crucial part of our business internally and externally. So, uh, if you think about the thing that clients ask you things to do, and what many, many companies do that day, okay, we start implementing it, dun, 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 and what comes out of that? Okay, the client may be happy, but most of the times you see that this is not actually, you have spent like two or three days implementing it, Client has played, paid it depending on your fee, maybe has paid 2,000 euros, 1,000 euros. And, and then you see that, okay, the client has given us a feedback and it wasn't actually the thing that they actually wanted or needed. So then you go and do, do, a, do it again and then implement the right thing. Instead of that, you could ask from the client when, when the client asks you to do this, then you just simply ask why. And you need to have the balls to ask why. And then if the, the first thing, if you know, is that the client can't say why they need it. That's the first warning that they might not need it at all. Or there might be some other things that they need, some other variants for that. Yeah, I think we have clients that if, if we did whatever they asked us to do, they would probably be bankrupt. Because they would just be doing the less important things or the wrong things or, or whatever. So it's really important to understand the business of the client. Uh, in order to help them. Yeah, and also like asking why it builds the confidence w between a, you and the client. It, it's, it, it shows that you actually care about their business because you, are, you, want to, you want to know the basis of the request. You want to actually build the right stuff for the client. You are not just building what they ask, but you are actually building what they need. And that's a big difference in, in when, when you start implementing uh, when we start doing maintenance, when you are not communicating like in, a, in an agile project every day with the client. And getting back to the topic of the uh, session here, this also is a very addictive way for us to 
create the vendor lock -in. Because when we can propose better uh, solutions to them than the ones that they originally thought of themselves, they become ad addictive to our improvement suggestions. Yeah, so with this technique, asking why you are actually positioning yourself above the, the normal technical companies. Okay, and, and another core value for our, 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 all, of your, uh, our, all of our company, and which, which is very uh, important, is that we have this method fail fast, fail often. Basically, this is the thing that uh, you may ask why to fail, isn't it like better just to succeed in everything, doing your business every time right? Uh, the thing there is that I would say that if you, if you don't fail, you are not pushing hard enough, you are not going forward, you are staying at the same level, you are not trying new things. But also, you should notice that when you, when you fail, you should fail once. If you fail two or three times in the same thing, then you are not doing a good business in that sense. And then, then it's not profitable that the clients are not happy at that point and you are actually going down in, in, the, in your internal development. So, and, and what another thing is uh, about the uh, failing is when, when we work as in uh, different countries, when we fail in Finland and we fail transparently, we actually transfer the information, for example, to Belgium. And when we said that, okay, we did this and this is how we failed in it, then our guys in Belgium uh, might not do it. I, I don't say that they don't do it because we are just humans, but they might not do it the same mistake and then that's a valuable thing for us as a company. And for this, we have internal tool which is fail of the month. Yeah, this is a very simple thing. We have fail of the month. Celebrating failure is kind of a joke, but it's a very useful one. Um, here's a very light example of a fail of the month that's less than a year old and that has the customer name there and everything. So the idea here is also has all the typos and everything here in the mail we have to fix, fix those. The background is that one of our customer sites um, was DDoS, so they had a denial of service attack. Um, basically nothing you can do about it at that, that very moment. The site was down for half an hour. Um, the issue was solved when Nebula, the uh, <coughs> internet service provider for, for the servers, uh, restricted foreign traffic coming from Russia. Um, some minor issues, some uh, ISPs not getting uh, reapers through assets for around an hour. And then in detail, what happened? Uh, at 2 before 1, we got the first SMS saying that the sites are down. We can't access them in any way because all the network connectivity is, is cut. Five minutes. Five minutes after that, we start working at, um, on the problem. Four minutes after that, we escalate the problem to the ISP, uh, suspecting that this might be uh, a DDoS attack or then the side of servers, but something wrong with the network. 30 minutes after that, we got information about excessive traffic to the servers. And 16 minutes after that, there's the first and most important fix. But, yeah. and on paper, that seems pretty decent. We didn't actually do any big mistakes as far as technical stuff goes. Animation. But what went wrong? The customer contacted us 11 minutes after we got the information. That was a failure. Uh, we responded six minutes after that, that yes, we are working on it, and actually we've known this for 17 minutes already. Uh, so we did fail in the example that, that I uh, talked about before, and this was like six months after we first discussed it with the team, so it wasn't a new thing. We should have fixed them, but we kind of repeated the mistakes that didn't happen for the first time. Um, and again, stating that if there is a four-step guideline taped on a wall at the office, 
And the first step is that come contact the customer, tell them that we, we are doing something. How can they know otherwise? Managing this failure, well, uh, obviously communicating what we know. Lessons learned. Remember, we are in the business of customer service, not in the business of bits and tuples. Uh, making sure this never happens again. Well, this is a human error that we made. Let's try to avoid repeating that again. And then the contact personnel or the people that were working on this. These are two of our community members. And the way we do this is that this message was sent to all at Unrocard.com and the client as well. We're being very transparent. We didn't do what we set the bar at. We didn't achieve that. But we promise not to repeat our mistakes. And again, after this, I'm pretty sure that the customer is more satisfied with us than before the DDoS attack that we didn't do anything about. Actually, Actually they were quite happy because the other media sites were down more than their site. Yeah. <laughs> it was somebody's Christmas fun, uh, crashing all of the media sites in Finland. Any okay. Right. Well, as as the slide says, uh, if you if you still think Drupal support and maintenance is a technical job, you weren't listening. How many how many still think it's it's a technical job? Nobody there is raising their hands. Right? <laughs> but again, as said, this is the easiest thing to understand, you can just put it in a tweet and everybody will understand it, but actually following these principles is something that you need to concentrate on on a daily basis. Alright, that's it. Thank you, and uh, any questions, comments? Have you had any similar experiences? All of your sites just work. I'm really, ha I'm really happy if this is the thing that we are doing very, very great in Drupal business. This is good for every Drupal company if we don't have any problems. Do you use the same model for the sort of I can repeat that. Do you use the same model with the government and public businesses? Well, all of our clients. Why should we treat them differently? Well, they... I was suggesting that they will treat you differently. Well. Um, that might be true if we did that on the first day of the cooperation. But of course, when we've reached a kind of joint history that we work for the customers for, for months or even years, they do know how our company operates and they know how we do our business. So nobody will be baffled over why we admit to our failures. Instead, we see a lot of our um, clients also on the public or the third sector like picking up on the principles that we have in the, in the agile world or, or agile business world because um, they are good, good principles being transparent and, and that. thanks for the question oh, we have just some experiences with the public businesses which they have money for development but they don't have uh, money for support so this sort of makes it all much more difficult yeah well, of course there's no silver bullet for all the problems that you go by, by, by the instinct of the day i have one question as well uh, standard model um, how does it work when you have some uh, some kind of divided responsibility in a sense that the production environment is hosted on, on the client's own infrastructure and you don't have direct access. And in, in this sense, s somehow, is it possible to at all provide this kind of maintenance service and how, how this interaction would be different in this situation? Well, the, the nosy wise as answer to that is that there's no such thing as divided responsibility. It's, or it means that if, if there's one company or one person in res uh, responsible for one thing, then, then the responsibility is 
if there's two parties being res uh, responsible for something, then their joint responsibility is 50%, so it's divided by two. But um, honestly speaking, the, the way we operate is that usually we get the customer the whole package. We don't host the servers ourselves. They might host them somewhere, or we use a hosting provider from, from a hosting company. But the way we arrange our maintenance is that if stuff, stuff breaks, they always contact us. They don't need to know whether the application broke, or the server broke, or the network broke. They just need to know that if it doesn't work from their point of view, call Eli. Yeah, uh, as, as, I, as I do this daily basis, it's the most important thing, and I have to repeat, is the communications, even more in this situation, when when we have, for example, in the public sector, it can be so that the client needs to host their own system inside their own server room. And in that situation, we need to be very clear in the communication. Also to the technical people, remember to talk to them in a technical way, so that they don't get frustrated that we try to speak to uh, in a vague way. And then also remember to communicate it back to the customer itself or the business owner. So it, it comes back to the uh, communication in every case, uh, depend, not depending on who's hosting, where it's hosted, and who's doing the maintenance. Hello. You said you had a five-member team working support or maintenance. Um, the maintenance work varies a lot. Sometimes they're all hands on deck and sometimes there's really not much to do. How do you utilize them to be still responsive for emergencies? It is a uh, good question. Um, Can I answer that? You're the person. Yeah. Well, basically, we are using very flexible resources. So, uh, if there is a quiet time, let's say summer, it's most of the time, like at least the public sector people, as you were saying, they are, they are on their holidays because they have to keep their holidays in the summer. So at that time, we kind of like, if, if not of all members can be, and they cannot be at the same time on summer holidays, we body list them into smaller projects. And then again, because we do projects, and we don't have every people 100% 100 fully working in a project, we body list them also to doing the maintenance tasks. So we have like a core team that gets all the time has also additional members. So that's how we can balance the workload. And of course, uh, when a normal time we don't have like enough work, if there are quiet weeks, then we start. We can we have time to do some internal development because that's also a very uh, key element of our work. Yeah. Um, the turnover for your fireman team is somewhere around three to five hundred thousand euros a year, depending on it. But anyway, it's not just the monthly fees. Uh, how would you say it? What's the per percentage between actual maintenance work and continuous development or small development, whatever you like to call it, uh, in your team? I would say that, that continuous development is around 70% or something like that. Yeah, I mean, what I've seen uh, from our, our accounting systems is that we have teams, have people in the continuous development or maintenance team that have had invoicing rates uh, over a six, period, six month period of over 84%. Or 84% was that like Janis, when I, when I asked. So they do a lot of uh, consulting as well. But it's the kind of fl flexible uh, stuff that you need to do this three day thing within the ne next two weeks. Meaning that if a site crashes, you drop your, your other tasks, do the kind of the fast thing, and then get back, get back to the um, develop, developing things when you start. So, so basically, just coming in. So basically, what is in the daily day basis in the management side is that me and Jonas are discussing almost daily basis on what resources we have free and what we can use and who would be best for doing this small project for the client. Yeah, usually, when we have a project ending or a project scaling down, when, when it's published or, or the project is ending, usually it's, it's Hilary who's always snatching the people from the project and, and putting them uh, to do this continuous development stuff. So usually the 
utilization rate for these people is really good. Okay, uh, continuation question. Do you, um, well, in my experience, some developers really don't enjoy uh, maintenance work with, it, with its hard interruptions and they want, they, they like to, they talk about the flow and they like to concentrate on their work. Is it, is it something that we have to recruit certain types of people just to do that or is it something that you'll just have to make them understand it's part of their job or, or do you have any problems with We've with never recruited thing? anybody for that team. They just, they just become people. Like, of course, they, they, it's a voluntary thing, nobody can be put to the maintenance team if they don't want to do that. But, and usually even the people that don't want to do this might do a commerce module implementation on the commerce project that they did six months ago. So they know the product. It's not kind of maintenance work for them. It's, again, continuous development for a, pro for a project that they've built. Yes. Yeah. So, like, well, for example, one of our employees has stated really clearly that he doesn't want to do, uh, like, everyday basis the maintenance work, but it's okay for him then again to do it between projects, like one week or something like that. Yeah, those people just want to know that they that they don't get stuck in the best thing in the company. So you. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, monitoring. Do you uh, offer 24-7 throughput specific monitoring to your clients? Short answer. Oh, there's no short answer. Yes and no. We do offer it, but as of today, we have zero 24 by 7 Google clients because we the price so high. So usually, you, don't need, you need to have a really, really big global service in order to that make sense. And of course, that would be possible. Uh, usually, the, the monitoring and, and maintenance that is needed outside of the normal working hours is not related to the application itself, right? It's related to the lower layers of the architecture, the, the servers, or, or, whatever. or the integrations. They, they might need something. And then they, of course, need uh, knowledge about how things are built, or where are we, where, where's the CRM, and how is it, is the software in there. But then again, we have to uh, remember that it's different thing in different market market areas, like between, for example, Latvia and Finland, the price difference is so totally different, so it varies, like, like in the things, as, as we work in Finland, me and Jonas, it's the thing that when we said that, oh, this is, this, uh, high in price and then the customers start okay we have just this small market so it's not profitable as let's go down one scale in the, in the, in the uh, monitoring and this kind of stuff and usually the customers don't have 24 by 7 support for their internal functions either so it doesn't make sense for us to have it either or it doesn't make sense to pay for that of course more is more Okay. All right. There's Thanks. seven minutes over time. Yes. Uh, well, Thanks, sir. If you have any, uh, if I may, one last question. Okay. <laughs> Before the last question, if you have any more questions or comments, we will be outside of the room in just a minute. Uh, do you have any good advice about taking uh, customer satisfaction surveys? I mean, how often you do it? In which format? Or are you counting smileys? Or how do you do that? The simple answer is, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> the customer says it's a survey. And then the net promoter score. Net promoter score. That's it. That's an easy thing. You can do that every month. And if it takes, if you just take, don't do you know how the net promoter score works? We basically give just one number of uh, how willing would you be to recommend this service to another company or how well this work uh, performs in com uh, comparison with other similar services. Yeah. So how would you recommend this? Um, and then basically you have one question there, you pick a question, I would or would not recommend it, or pick an uh, answer, and then you have a box where you can input your, your um, free text. I mean, the whole idea is it literally takes you a minute. Yeah, because because if it's taking too long, if, if it's taking even three minutes, then they won't do it. People won't just do it. 
but they will do it once, and then we can't compare all of our performance month after month. Okay. All right. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you.